Today, this is our third day of virtual lecture series and hope all participants are in a good condition today and you can enjoy until the end of uh, this, the end of, uh, for a moment, until the end of the series on international virtual course. So my name is Fitria Dwi Ayuning Tias and I will be your host for the morning session lecture today. And before starting, I would like to remind you to fill out the attendance list and please join our Slack chat room and also provide your public key for hands-on session. So today I will start with the first speaker. So we have four speakers today. The first speaker is Professor Kazuyoto. Good morning, Professor Kazuyuki Sakamoto. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So the first is Professor Kazuyuki Sakamoto and uh, continue with Professor Junichi Takahara. And in the uh, afternoon session, we have Dr. Lee Tian Kun and Dr. Pung Feedback. I'm sorry if I misspell your, um, your name. So I will start for the first speaker. First speaker is, as a brief introduction, Professor Kazuki Sakamoto will give a lecture about atomic layer materials formed on solid surfaces and investigating exotic physical phenomena for nanoscience and nanotechnology. Professor Kazuki Sakamoto uh, is a professor in the Department of Applied Physics Graduate School of Engineering Osaka University with the research expertise on condensed matter physics, material physics, solid state physics, and spectroscopy. Am I right, Professor Kazuki Sakamoto? Yep. Okay, so it's already 8.30 in the morning on Jakarta Times, on Indonesian Times. So I will give you a time and place to start your presentation. Professor Kazuki Sakamoto, please start your presentation. May I share my slides? Okay, thank you. And uh, can you see the slides? It's okay? Yes, we can see the slide. Okay, good morning. I'm uh, Kazuki Sakamoto from uh, the Department of Applied Physics of uh, Osaka University. And first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And as introduced, I would like to present uh, uh, well, give a lecture about uh, atomic layer materials which are formed on solid surfaces. And these atomic layer materials uh, are known to show exotic physical phenomena which can be used for nanoscience and nanotechnology. So here is the outline of my talk. So I would like to first explain what is atomic layer materials and also why we are using solid surfaces to grow atomic layer materials and also some uh, exotic or uh, peculiar physical properties of atomic layer materials. And after that, I will also introduce uh, uh, the method that I'm using to investigate uh, the physical properties of atomic layer materials. It's called photoelectron spectroscopy. And after that, I would like to show some example about uh, uh, some uh, uh, physical properties of atomic layer materials. And uh, the first one is about the Rushby effect, which is one of the most uh, well-known uh, physical properties which uh, occur at, uh, on atomic layer materials. And if I have enough time, I also want to um, show some results that we got about topological insulators and organic semiconductors. And finally, I would like to summarize my talk. So let's start from atomic materials. And uh, before going to at atomic layer materials, I would like to start about uh, why we are using surface. So, well, I know uh, all of you know what is a surface, but uh, what is interesting to study the surface and why we are using surfaces. So, do you know these words by Pauli? God made the bark and the surface was invaded by the devil. So this means if you want to study uh, solid state physics, the surface is different from the bark. In case of the bark, you have the three-dimensional transformational symmetry. That means you have the symmetry along the x, y, and z direction. It's uh, the basic for solid physics. But as a surface, one 
symmetry, translational symmetry is, is broken, and you have only two uh, two dimensional uh, translational symmetry in the x and y uh, direction. So this uh, lack of the symmetry is called as the devil, but in case of the physics, it will give different or more exciting physical properties at the surface. And the surface uh, is uh, will give uh, different properties, but if you think a cubic whose size is uh, a material whose uh, size is uh, one meter cubic, do you have any idea about what is the uh, atomic ratio of the surface atom compared to the bulk atom? Can you use a chart to give, to give me some, some value about uh, uh, the ratio, number ratio of uh, uh, surface atom compared to the bulk ones? Yeah, please use a chat. I, I can check. Okay, so it seemed like uh, uh, the question was not so not so easy. But uh, if you think uh, a material whose size is uh, one meter, uh, usually uh, the difference between between two atomic layers is uh, uh, two or three angstroms. That means 0.2 or 2.3 nanometer. And this leads to a number ratio of uh, 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 10. So if you have this kind of large material, a uh, huge material, as uh, a surface, will not uh, uh, the, the physical property of this material will be mainly uh, caused by, by the bulk atom. And the surface will not contribute so much. And if we go to a, a smaller materials of a uh, Millimeter, one millimeter cubic, or one, one micrometer cubic, still the number ratio is quite small. Even that this one micrometer cubic material, uh, the number ratio of surface atom is 10 to the minus third to 10 to the minus fourth. So that means uh, the surface uh, atom is only 0.1% to 0.01%. And uh, even that this small material, the surface will not contribute so much. But if we go to a nanometer cubic material, the number ratio become 0.5. So that means half of uh, the atom is a surface, belongs to the surface. And since the surface is different from the bulk, in the, this kind of small material, the surface become very important. And this means the surface is important in nanoscience and nanotechnology. So this is for a simple surface. But surface has also another properties. So by using a surface, since one side is free, we can grow low dimensional structures that do not exist in nature. For example, <coughs> so here you can see some honeycomb structure here. And it looks like a graphene seed, but it's not. If you look at the size here, it's a, a, this honeycomb is much larger than that of a, a, a graphene. And uh, this honeycomb structure was made by evaporate uh, organic molecule on top of metal surface. So, and this uh, uh, molecular graphene seed cannot, well, does not exist in nature, and it can only be grown on a solid surface. And we can also grow one-dimensional atomic wires like this. So if uh, you can make, uh, for example, metallic wire, we can send current through this wire. Uh, and also we can grow zero-dimensional nanodots. So, by using the surface, we can grow low dimensional structures that do not exist on the surface. But growing this kind of material, what is interesting to grow this kind of material? So this is a word of Aristotle. Uh, he said, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And if you think this sum of the part as the addition of the substrate, the surface, and the atomic layer, the full is greater, I mean, you will have an additional exotic physics here. So by just making this kind of atomic layer, you will not have a property of this atomic layer, but you will have another further exotic physics will come when you grow this kind of material. And uh, so let's go to atomic layer materials. So the most well-known atomic uh, material will be this graphene. Uh, which uh, was a target material for the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010. So it has this uh, honeycomb structure. And uh, 
uh, thanks to this honeycomb structure, it shows this kind of very peculiar electronic structure as a K point. So the dispersion here is linear, and it shows this kind of what's so called Dirac cone. And this linear dispersion means the mass of this, the, the charge is, is zero here, so it's a massless uh, Dirac fermion. And also by <coughs> the slope of this, uh, this uh, uh, dispersion, one can obtain uh, the speed of the charge in graphene. And uh, here is a value, and this is very close to the speed of the light. So that means in graphene. So why graphene is interesting is it's because uh, the mobility is very high because the mass is it's, uh, a massless Dirac fermion. And also the speed of the charge is very high. So by using this one, it will be possible to uh, create uh, a very high functional device. But if you look at this seat, you will notice you have an edge here because uh, uh, the, the seat itself cannot be infinite. So you will have edge of uh, the graphene. And uh, if you look at this, you will notice there are different edges. So these edges look like a graph, a uh, zigzag chain. And here it look like an armchair. So we call this armchair edge and this edge. <clears throat> and uh, these two edge have uh, different uh, electronic properties like this, uh, I'm sorry, it's written in Japanese. And uh, if you look at this zigzag chain, it has only not charge, but spin, electron spin appear at this edge. So this means if you send the current through this, or well, if you have a, a graphene nanoribbon like this, you can send the current here, and you can also send the spin current here. Not only the charge, but the spin degree of freedom at the edge. But this kind of nanoribbon is very difficult to make well, uh, at least it's very difficult to make uh, uh, graphene nanoribbon with a high quality. So uh, to be able to send the currency also as a material, uh, most known is the, the one which is called topological insulator. It was uh, the target material for the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2016. And uh, in topological insulator, the bulk, the inside is insulating, but the surface is metallic. And it has the same dispersion as that of the graphene. It has a Dirac cone like this. But the difference is that here you only have the charge here, electron. But here you have you can have spin charge, uh, spin degree of freedom. That means this electron state is spin polarized. So by using this one, it's metallic. You can send current, and you can also send spin current here. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, you are familiar with topological insulator, but this topological insulator, topological material, the word topological comes from a mathematic words, topology. So here I put a cup, donut, mug, and apple. So if you group these four stuff into two groups, how do you group them? Can you use a chat? So please group this four material in, uh, to, into two, two groups. How, how to group them? Donuts plus half and uh, yeah, glass plus apple, yeah. Okay. But uh, usually if you just- Put and two. From Husni is is Suda. They said food and tools and say. Sorry. Uh, food and tools. Yeah. Uh, usually, if you group them, you will group like this. Food yes. and tools. So food here is a cup. Here is the mug. Donuts. So this two, this material. Oh, sorry. Oh. So this material uh, you can use to fill liquid like tea coffee, and anything. And these two, you can eat them. So this is a normal way to group this four stuff. But according to the topology, it's not, it's different. It will group in this way. So it's because if you want to change the shape from the apple, you can just change it continuously. Just put your thumb into the center of this and push it and you will just make this one. 
and for uh, the mug and donuts is a little bit difficult, but uh, if you look like this, you will notice you can change it continuously, the shape. So that, the difference between this group and this group is that here there is no hole, and here you have one hole. So if you want to change this one, this apple to donuts, you have to create a hole. So that means the change is not continuous anymore. So according to this topology, you have to group this and this. And by using this topology sense into material or electronic structure, you can have uh, different uh, topological materials, like uh, topological insulator, topological superconductor, and so on. So this is what is a topological uh, uh, superconductor, uh, sorry, insulator, a topological material. And uh, in <coughs> topological insulator, you can have um, Spectrum as a surface, but uh, by creating atomic layer materials, atomic layers material on the surface, you can also have this kind of spin polarized electrons here. And this is called the Rushba effect. And I will explain this Rushba effect in a little bit more detail uh, later. But <clears throat> if you look at here, a uh, superconductor, for example, this uh, ion selenide is known to become a superconductor at the temperature below around 10, 10, 10 Kelvin, so at very low temperature. But the whole, this ion selenide on top of this STO material, strontium tantalum uh, oxide material, you create one layer of uh, ion selenide. Uh, the transition temperature will increase quite a lot and will become around 100 Kelvin. So 10 times higher than that of uh, ion selenide uh, bulk material. So this is what might happen if you create an atomic layer on top of a solid surface. You cannot create uh, an atomic layer, uh, atomic layer uh, ion selenide, uh, a free sanding one in nature, but you, you need to have a solid surface like this. And you can have something extra, some exotic physics here. And uh, the good point of having this high transition temperature is that in case of bulk, if the transition temperature is 10 Kelvin, you need to use liquid helium, which is quite expensive. But if the transition temperature is around 100 Kelvin, you, you can use liquid nitrogen instead of liquid helium, whose price is much cheaper. So for this one, I think it will be able to use uh, in industry, or if it's possible, but uh, not the one in bulk because uh, liquid helium is now quite expensive. And also, if you can create a superconductor on top of a, a topological insulator, you can create a topological superconductor. So that su this superconductor will become topological uh, superconductor. And in a topological superconductor, you will have Majorana fermion. I, I'm not sure if uh, you heard about this name and uh, a minor fermion which can be used in quantum computer. So by just using uh, adding superconductor and topological insulator is not just the sum of uh, the physical property of these two, but you can have something more like this. So uh, I hope you are now, uh, you understand what uh, will be interesting to study the uh, atomic layer materials for solid surfaces. Here uh, we have some exotic physics, but if you don't know, what is happening, it's just a magic. And, but we need to know what is happening here and we need to know the physics behind. So we have to change this magic to science. And if you are a magician, you can just use a stick and uh, to know what is happening, but we are not. And we need a tool to know what is, uh, what is uh, uh, physics behind uh, this, uh, well, exotic physics. And the, the tool that I'm using is a photoelectron spectroscopy. Well, I think you know what is photoelectric effect. You shine the light on the solid and electron come out, photoelectron come out. So we are using this uh, photoelectric effect and uh, to uh, get information about the electron inside uh, the atomic layer of material. So our next section of photoelectron spectroscopy. So as I told you, it's a photon in, electron out, method, so we shine light on the material and photoelectron come out and we de detect it and observe this kind of band dispersion. So here is a momentum or a wave vector 
and uh, you have the binding energy in the y-axis. And from this one, you can have information about the velocity of the charge and also about the effective mass, which uh, give information about the mobility of the charge. So by using, by just measuring this kind of band dispersion electronic structure, you can know how the charge behave inside the material. And uh, so I would like to go in a little bit more detail about the photoelectron spectroscopy. So for electron spectroscopy, photoelectron spectroscopy, we use two conservation law. The first one is energy conservation law. It's uh, like this. So H nu is the energy of the light. Ek is the energy, uh, kinetic energy of the photoelectron. Uh, phi is a work function, the energy between the vacuum level and the Fermi level here, and Eb is the binding energy of the electron inside the material. So if you know the kind uh, work function and uh, the energy of the work function and the energy of the light, you can get information about the uh, binding energy by just measuring the kinetic energy. And uh, for example, for, by measuring the core level, of a material. You can get information about the charge state of the material because uh, the charge state of a surface atom is different from the bulk one. Uh, you will have a shift here, which is called core level shift. And by measuring this shift, you will give information about uh, the charge state of the surface atom. And you can also give information about, get information about the atomic structure of uh, the, the surface atom and also of the adsorbate. And here is one example. So this is oxygen 1s core level uh, uh, from an ox oxygen covered the silicon surface. And here you have eight different components. And by analyzing this uh, six one, the, the three green and three red one, uh, we obtain like the atomic structure to be like this. So, and this uh, red one as a stable oxygen, so they are stable by time and also stable by temperature. So this is a stable uh, chemical absorption side. And this green one here, the intensity decreased by time. So uh, this uh, structure is a metastable species. So by just measuring the core level, you can get information about how uh, uh, the, the molecules, the uh, atomic species absorb at the surface. And here we have two other uh, peaks here, uh, which come from the physics of oxygen, physics of uh, oxygen molecules. But uh, regarding that to the uh, physics of oxygen molecule, you have only one absorption uh, configuration, but you have two peaks. And uh, these two peaks was also observed when absorbing oxygen on top of graphite surface. Here, you have two peaks. And the origin of the two peaks come from uh, the uh, final state uh, effect, which is called final state. So this is the initial state. And in case of oxygen, uh, the spin of uh, the electron spin of the outermost uh, level is parallel. So that means oxygen uh, molecule is usually paramagnetic, like this. And uh, the one square level, you have two electrons whose uh, spin uh, tend to uh, orient it in the opposite direction, like this. And this means if you excite one of them, you will have a different final state like this. So if you uh, excite this red one, the final state will become like this. If you excite this uh, blue one, the final state will become like this. And here, since each electron spin can be regarded as a small magnet, electron magnet, this energy here and the energy here will be different. So this means this come from the same initial state, but from a different final state. So this also means if here the electron spin are opposite, that means it's no magnetic material. You will have only one peak here because uh, the final state, you will not have any difference in the, uh, the energy of the final state. So this means you can have information about the atomic structure here and also about the spin state. That means about the magnetic properties of the atoms of, uh, as of atom or as of uh, molecules. And uh, so this is come from the energy conservation law. And as I told you, we have another conservation law and it's the conservation law. So I would like to skip the detail, 
but uh, from this momentum conservation law, one can obtain uh, the wave number uh, or wave vector or the momentum along the surface uh, parallel direction here by measuring the kinetic energy and also the emission angle here. And by measuring this one, for example, in the old day, we just uh, rotate uh, the analyzer and can obtain this kind of, of uh, spectra. And you can follow this peak and obtain the band dispersion. But uh, thanks to the latest uh, well, uh, detector, now we can get this kind of band dispersion without rotating the sample and uh, with, well, not one shot, but in a few, uh, few seconds here. And also if you cut this part here and uh, we can get information about uh, uh, so something for a Fermi surface and you will so, uh, notice uh, how the electron can behave in the mark. So here the electron cannot go in this direction but can go in this direction. So you can discuss about the anisotropy of uh, the electronic properties by just cutting this face and measuring uh, the momentum uh, in kx and ky momentum space. So, and uh, in the lab, so this is uh, the two conservation law. So, how we can get uh, information about the electronic state, and uh, we need a light source. And in our lab, we usually use discharge jump or helium discharge jump or xenon discharge jump to measure the balance band. So, here is the energy of uh, the lamp. And uh, to measure the core level, we usually use the magnesium or aluminum uh, K alpha line, whose energy is uh, something like this. So, but uh, here the energy is fixed. So sometimes we need some other energy. For example, uh, when we are measuring the core level of silicon, we use a photo energy of 130 or 140 electron volt, but we cannot use this line. And uh, in that case, we have to go to a synchrotron radiation facility. Have you heard about the synchrotron radiation facility? No? Uh, well, so this is just a cartoon about how does it look like. So we inject electrons, which are accelerated to a speed close to the light speed. And here the electrons are stored in this uh, ring, which is called storage ring. And uh, when uh, the charge is bent or make a curve, it will emit uh, electromagnetic uh, light, so uh, light, which is called synchrotron radiation light, like this. So we have, if we have a bending magnet, we will have some light here. And this is called antilator. We have a lot, lot of um, uh, magnet. And uh, we, you can make this uh, zigzag motion for the electron and can shine an e, e, uh, a higher uh, intensity light compared to this bending magnet light. And here is a one example. So this is uh, the brightness of the sun. This is a brightness of the light, which come from bending magnet. And this is a, a brightness of a light, which come from uh, this undulator. So we we'll notice here, there is a huge difference between uh, the, the brightness of this, uh, the light, which come from these two uh, magnets. And the next I would like to show uh, a, a movie, which you can download from uh, this website from uh, a Danish uh, synchrotron radiation facility, Astrid. So in now, uh, nowadays, uh, the ring is usually uh, like a circle. It's a round uh, shape. But uh, this is an old one, and it uh, looks like uh, a square type. But uh, in principle, the mechanism is the same. So the electron uh, inject into the storage, storage range, and uh, here like this. And after that, uh, the electron a bunch to have a stronger light. So you will notice a bunch like this and uh, this bunch electron will give light when they are bent from either the bending magnet or from the end undulator like this and the lights will now next go through a, a, a duct which is called beam line and then the light will hit the sample and the electron, photo electron will come out and will be detected. So here you have two uh, hemispherical electrodes and uh, only uh, the electron with a certain energy can pass here and can be detected. So this is how does a synchrotron radiation facility look like? And here is uh, how many synchrotron radiation facilities are in the world. 
So you will notice there are a lot of in the United States, one in Canada, uh, well, two in, the, uh, in UK, one in Spain, one in Italy, two in France, uh, two in Germany, one in Denmark, one in Sweden, one, one in Switzerland. And if we go to, to Europe, we have one in India, one in Thailand, one in Singapore, one in uh, Taiwan, and uh, two in uh, China, one in, in Korea, and actually we have eight, uh, no, seven synchronous radiation facility in Japan, and we are constructing another one in Sendai, a city which is uh, a little bit north from, from Tokyo. So that means in Japan, we have a lot of synchronous radiation facility, and that is the reason why I have an easy access to a synchronous radiation facility. And uh, so, uh, as I told you, <coughs> we have to accelerate, excuse me, we have to accelerate the electron. And uh, here is uh, four different uh, synchronous radiation facilities in Japan. And this is uh, the largest one, uh, one of the largest one in, in, in the world, which is called Springgate. And here, the electron accelerates to an energy of eight giga electron volt. <coughs> uh, excuse me. So can you imagine how big this energy is? Eight giga electron volt. It's a huge energy. Well, I think you know uh, Pokemon or Pikachu, right? You 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 might know Pikachu and uh, we know Pokemon. Pikachu sensei. Yeah. Yeah, we know Pikachu. Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, we. Can know, you hear me? We know Pikachu. Ah, uh, yeah, you know Pikachu. Okay, that's great. So here is Pikachu. You know, Wait. and uh, the energy of. Pikachu is only 100 kilovolt. So to operate spring gates, you need 80,000 Pikachu. So you might know how big or how much power uh, we need to operate this kind of uh, facility. But uh, okay, anyway, let's go to, to the next slide. So I want to skip this one. It's a little bit more uh, in detail. And uh, so by using uh, this photoelectron spectroscopy, we can get information about the, the energy and momentum of uh, the electron. That means uh, the charge degree of freedom. But electron has another degree of freedom. And this is the spin degree of freedom. And to be able to, to measure it, we need a, more, uh, a further detector. So we have to attach uh, another detector to this hemispherical photoelectron uh, spectrometer. And uh, the one that we have in Osaka is a MOT detector. It's called a MOT detector. And this detector, we use the spin orbit coupling. So we have a heavy element. And uh, by uh, injecting the electron, which come out from uh, the spectrometer here, you can have different count. Uh, by, by putting two detectors, you will be able to uh, get information about the spin state, what electron spin, which come from, from uh, the sample like this. So, and if you have four detector, it will be possible to measure, for example, for this one, we can measure the X and Z component of the spin. And from this one, we can measure the Y and Z component of the spin. So by having two more detector, it's possible to measure uh, the three dimensional uh, orientation of the spin. But this multi data has one problem, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's high energy. So we usually have to accelerate the energy uh, till an uh, uh, energy of 25 kilovolt, so one fourth of Pikachu. So it's a quite high energy. And uh, this high energy, we usually have a low low back scattering probability, and which lead to low efficiency. So the figure merit of uh, this mod detector is. 10 to the minus fourth compared to normal photoelectron uh, spectroscopy. So this means the, uh, we need to, a longer time for the measurement or we need to kill uh, the resol resolution and we lose uh, some information by when we use this mod detector. And, but uh, we also have, well, we are planning to build this uh, new uh, Detector, spin detector, which is called very low electron energy diffraction. It was uh, uh, made by my colleague, a former colleague, uh, Okuda. And uh, instead of uh, using a spin orbit coupling, here uh, we use a spin exchange interaction. And by using this one, uh, 
since we use a low energy electron, the back scattering probability will become higher and we will get a high efficiency and the figure of merit will become 10 to the minus second. So here the figure, figure of merit is, is much higher and we get more information compared to the mode detector. And uh, data that we'll show uh, later will mainly have mainly uh, be obtained by using this V-lead uh, photoelectron. Uh, so next I want to go to the Rushby effect. And if you're interested, uh, here are some papers that uh, we published regarding to the Rushby effect. And uh, well, you can read some of them if you're interested to know what is interesting and what kind of uh, physics uh, you can get by studying this, this effect. So uh, let's start from a normal Rushby effect. So if you have a normal material, usually the band is is degenerate, the spin are degenerate. So here you have one band and you have uh, two electrons here with a different uh, spin orientation. So you have uh, the up and down spin in one band here. And this is a surface state of the kappa one on one surface. And here you can see it show a parabolic dispersion, which means uh, the surface electron on kappa one on one can behave like a free electron. But this is a case of a kappa one on one. But if we go to a, a heavier element, the gold, and by using the same surface, gold 111, which is also non magnetic, here you have two bands instead of only one. So, in case of copper, there are only one band here, but in case of gold, you have two bands here. And uh, these two bands are spin polarized. And uh, so, even if it's non magnetic, and this splitting is called Rashba type splitting. So I want to explain what is Rashba. And uh, so in case of bulk, you have two uh, symmetry. Uh, the one is the time reversal symmetry and space inversion symmetry inside the bulk. And time reversal symmetry mean, so if uh, one spin go in this direction, the other spin in the other direction, it will have the opposite spin like this. Can, can you see? Can you see me? So it's like this. So it's because you can uh, consider the spin like the rotation of uh, uh, the electron. So if you go to, uh, to the, uh, if you reverse the time, uh, the rotation of, uh, of the electron will be reversed and this will call, make uh, uh, opposite spin like this. And the space inversion symmetry means if you have a spin here and you, will ha you should have the same spin in the opposite place like this. And uh, this can be explained by using these two equations. And if you combine these two equations, you will notice that you should have both spin up and down here, up and down here as well. Otherwise, you cannot satisfy these two symmetries. So this is a case of the part. And you can also uh, 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 notice that from this uh, Hamiltonian, and here is a, a spin orbit coupling a Hamiltonian part. And uh, if you have a space inversion symmetry, you will not have any potential gradient. And that means this, you can ignore this part and only have this part. So this is why uh, the spin are not polarized inside the part. But if we go to the surface, the space inversion symmetry is broken because uh, uh, according to the uh, surface normal direction, you don't have any uh, symmetry, translation symmetry anymore. So you only have this time reversal symmetry. And if you rewrite the Hamiltonian, we can obtain this so called Rashba Hamiltonian. And from this one, you will notice the spin direction is uh, parallel to the surface and perpendicular to the wave vector or to the momentum here. So this is the Rashba spin in a normal uh, or ideal um, two dimensional electron gas. So once again, uh, with a combination of a spin orbit coupling together with a, a broken symmetry along the surface in normal direction as a band a spin, and uh, uh, you have a spin polarized band in this on the surface and also in case of atomic layer materials. So this is for an ideal case, but we have a real crystal structure or real uh, atomic layer materials on the surface. And in this case, we have periodic, periodic structure, which makes some symmetric. And also, 
uh, some other cases. But in our group, we focus on the symmetry. How the symmetry can modify or can affect the Russia effect. And uh, so, and also, uh, I want to explain why we are studying the Russia wave. It's because uh, there is uh, a quite important or interesting physical properties, but also the rush wave effect can be used in uh, in uh, spin training devices. So nowadays, the information volume, the uh, volume of information uh, show an explosive increase, so it's continuous increase, and we have a huge hard disk, we have uh, a higher processing power. And uh, but regarding to the information power, we can use that not only the charge, but the spin degree of freedom and uh, to have uh, more information or this is called magnetic uh, spintronics as here. And we can obtain this by making the magnetic material smaller and smaller. And uh, this one you all, all already have in market because when I was a PhD student, a hard disk of uh, a few megabytes was a maximum, but now you can have a terabyte and gigabyte uh, give a guy terabyte uh, with a quite uh, reasonable price. So this magnetic uh, spintronics is already the market. It's okay, but uh, regarding the processing power, uh, the conventional electronics we are we are already in the limit of the conventional electronics, or we have something for, uh, new uh, to uh, make uh, to have a higher processing power. And one way is to use a semiconductor spintronics. So this is one example of a semiconductor spintronics. This is a, a field effective transistor, but a spin field effective transistor. So usually you only send the current and uh, apply the gate bias here to on off uh, the current. But uh, if you use the spin current instead of uh, the uh, charge current, uh, the consuming power will be uh, one over uh, 1,000, that means 0.1 percent. So you can reduce the consuming power quite a lot. So electronic is like this, and by using uh, the spin degree of freedom, we have also additional function to, to the device. You have possibility to add uh, additional function. But this is has been proposed uh, more than 30 years ago, but it's still not on the market. And uh, so this means it's very hard to make this one and we need to know what is happening or the spin feature or spin physics of this atomic material, uh, atomic layer materials and also surface uh, to be able to create this kind of device. And this is just, uh, well, I think it was uh, 10 years ago. And uh, this time I, I I, and I'm sorry it's written in Japanese, but I say if uh, this kind of spintronic devices uh, is realized, uh, for example, the lifetime of the battery of the smartphone will be 10 times longer. But unfortunately, we did not succeed to uh, make the devices yet, and we are still uh, on the way to, to make it. So next I want to go to uh, how the symmetry can affect uh, the rush effect. So the first one is that, so this surface has uh, belonged, the structure belongs to the P3 M1 plane group. Oh, sorry. Uh, to the plane group. And here you have a mirror plane here, and uh, the mirror plane is rotated 30 degrees from uh, the unit cell. So with this one, you have a C3 symmetry at this K point. So that means you have a three-fold uh, three symmetry without any mirror plane. And if we focus on this gamma k direction, here, sorry, can wait a bit, sorry. Okay, so this is not, does not go but okay. So here we have a band which show a split here, but this split is not the same as a rush effect. So, I'm not sure if you remember, but uh, the rush wave effect show a speed along the wave, uh, momentum direction, wave direction like this. But here the speed is along the energy direction. And uh, if you look at the spin, we have a rush wave spin here, but here the spin suddenly stand up like this. And uh, uh, well, I would like to skip the detail of that one, but uh, this stand up 
upstanding spin come from the symmetry because this C3 symmetry will produce a circular motion of uh, the electron in the XY plane. And if you have a circular motion in the XY plane, we'll have a magnetic field in the Z direction. And since the spin tends to become parallel to the magnetic field, the absence spin here comes from the magnetic field, which is induced from this C3 symmetry. And uh, I think I have to hurry up a bit. So here we notice the symmetry play a great role to the Rashba spin. And we also go to uh, another uh, symmetry. So here next, uh, the K point has a C3 V symmetry, a C4 symmetry with a, a mirror plane. And here we have this K point, this blue S1 is above this S1 prime, red S1 prime, but after passing this K point, this red S1 prime become below this S1, blue S1. And this look like a Rashba type spin splitting, but here you notice this K point doesn't have any time reverse asymmetry, which was believed to be a necessary condition for the Rashba effect. So here it's gamma K and Km. So it doesn't have any time reverse asymmetry. And uh, we also can explain this uh, uh, Rashba type uh, splitting uh, originating from the c 3 symmetry of this K point, because the c 3 symmetry is the same as a gamma point. And if you have the same symmetry, you will have uh, the same or very similar electronic solution. And uh, well, I think I, this is for another example. So here, uh, by using a system which has a C1H symmetry here, we can create a non vertical spin structure. So in case of an ideal case, you have this kind of vertical structure for all spin point along the minus y direction and all spin point along the plus y direction. Don't this, this is non-vertical, and this comes from uh, the locking of the spin at these two points, which has a C1H symmetry. So the C1H symmetry can lock the spin and can make this non-vertical uh, spin structure. So, but uh, we still have a problem to uh, realize the spin uh, FET devices, and it's uh, to make uh, the diffusion length of the spin uh, uh, longer. And to make that, there's one, uh, one way is to use another degree of freedom and it's a valid degree of freedom and we call it like electronics. And uh, while we try to make it and we succeeded, unfortunately, I only show the curtain here and here you have this valley which show an uh, uh, up spin here and the next one has a down spin here and you, cannot have a backscattering from here and here, and that means it might be possible to have a higher or longer uh, diffusion net, spin diffusion net, uh, if we can make this one, use this one uh, for devices. So electronics, spin tronics, electronics, and in electronics, you can have a low energy consumption and high efficiency. So this might be a way to create or realize a spin electronic devices. And uh, well, I think I have no time and if you're interested to know what is actually a Russia effect, please read this paper, Physical Regulator, which was published last year. And uh, if you have any question, you can just ask me. So I just want to go briefly. So this is how uh, we can understand the Russia effect. It's come from uh, the flaming rope, this one. And, uh, but uh, actually we can also explain all this spin using this uh, right hand screw rope. I don't have enough time. So I would like to skip all of this. And uh, I'm sorry, just want to say, uh, we can also uh, use this topological insulator to uh, make a topological uh, PN junction, which will also uh, promising uh, material for spintronic devices. Because here by applying gate voltage, you can have both P type or both N type and uh, you can send the current in this way or in the other way, spin current in one way by just changing uh, the gate voltage here. And for organic semiconductor, we also uh, measure something. And uh, well, I just want to say, uh, we are we was the first group that uh, obtained information about uh, the two dimension and mobility, mobility in uh, atomic layer organic molecules and uh, which has published quite a long time ago, but uh, we were the first one. And uh, we also discussed uh, 
uh, what is actually the origin of the charge uh, transport uh, mechanism inside of a bulk uh, organic uh, thin film or organic uh, atomic layer materials. So it's like this, this is just the action. So it's not the band, but it uh, should come from another uh, thing. So you might understand from discussion, this is for a solid inorganic materials. So it's better to go through the band, which is a lot here, but for uh, organic materials, since it's flexible, uh, it's better to just jump from one tree to another tree. So uh, the origin for the high mobility in uh, some uh, organic material will come from the vibration mediated of hopping transport. So this is a summary of the talk. And also want to thank all my colleagues. And uh, this is uh, the facilities that I do so far. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sensei, Sakamoto Sensei. And we have two questions here. So the first yeah. one is from Husmi Suda. For the photoelectron spectroscopy, Sensei, for the yeah. observation using photoelectron spectro uh, spectroscopy, uh, it's using the high energy uh, photon beams, I think. Yeah. Right. Am I right? So yeah. if we use it for observation of nanomaterials, for example, yeah. uh, does yeah. it give any change to the materials, like a disruption to the materials and changing the characterization of the materials we observe? Okay, so, so it depends. It depends quite a lot on the material. So, for example, uh, can you switch off your microphone? Oh, okay. Yep, thank you. So, it depends quite a lot on the material. For example, for organic materials, the light can easily destroy the material, the molecule. You have a CS bond on the organic material, and uh, the light can easily kill this bonding. And this, this makes uh, just uh, destroy the molecule or destroy the, the material. So we have to be very careful to, to, to do measurement for that one. And uh, also for in case of top gas insulator, so the way that I show, we, we can have some doping by just sh shining the light. And it's a way that uh, uh, we observe some time ago, but uh, we had a hard time to understand what's happening. Uh, so in that case, by, by doping, that means uh, top insulator is uh, the bulk of topological insulator is insulating in an ideal material. But uh, when you create a topological insulator, and even in a, a ultra vacuum condition, uh, the bulk is doped by charge. And uh, the uh, materials that we use, bismuth selenide, bismuth selenide, is usually, usually electron doped. But by shining the light, we can uh, change or dope hole inside the bulk and make it the bulk insulating. And that bulk is very stable, even in air condition. Oh. So by shining the light, sometimes you can change uh, the, the character or the physical property of the material. But in many cases, uh, since uh, the electron is very light or has almost no, no mass, it will not change uh, the physical property of the material so much. Okay. And okay. the second question is from Arif Irham. So, he would like to ask about the ARPES, ARPES measurement. Could yeah. the ARPES measurement perform in nano size material? And is there any important limitation or special, special specification for the material to be measured in ARPES? Okay, well, uh, the small, so it depends on, on the uh, spot, uh, size of the light spot. And uh, but well, usually in a in a lab, in a lab, uh, the speed is quite large. So and it's in the order of a uh, uh, few hundred micrometer. But if we go to a synchrotron radiation facility, at some uh, facilities, uh, the light is spot is uh, even smaller. Is in a uh, few hundred uh, nanometer. And that means by using that kind of light, we can measure this kind, uh, this kind of very small material as well. So we have some limits, of course, we cannot measure all the measurement. If uh, the size is uh, only a few nanometers, it's uh, very difficult. But uh, if you can just uh, arrange all of this small material in the same direction, it's still possible. So we cannot say we cannot measure it, but uh, 
the small material will be a little bit difficult. Sensei, thank you very much. One more question, one simple question related to Rasba effect from Yulis Tiono. Will the volume of hard disk go through the pico? Oh, sorry, can you? Can you? Uh, related to Rasba effect, will the volume of hard disk go through pico? Pico size less than nano. The, the size of the the volume of hard disk. Ah, the volume. I, I also... Well, I, I, it's impossible because the size of uh, the uh, the atom is is uh, already in the sub nanometer. Well, nanometer. we just save a few uh, few hundred uh, picometer will be fine. If you can have one atom or one molecule, and you can it uh, that one can have some magnet properties, it's possible. So in that sense, uh, well, not one pico but a few picometer will be still possible. Okay. Oh, there's another one question. Can you explain the influence of edge effect position on the graphene materials? What the difference of all like zigzag effect or the other effect? Oh, okay. So uh, I think I have to... So here you have two different uh, you have two different uh, edges, and uh, if you look at the uh, electronic state of these edges here for this armchair one, it just looks like this. So you have almost no electrons, but for this one you have a peak here, and this difference make the spin state here. Is it okay? Okay. So it's come from the difference in the, the electronic structure of the two, two edges. Okay, Sensei. I think that's all of the question because we also uh, reached the end of the time in the session. Thank you very much, uh, Sakamoto Sensei, for, for a very interesting presentation. And if there's any further question, uh, can our participant contact you directly? Uh, yeah, sure. Of course, and just email me, and I can. And uh, if uh, the email is not so, so easy, uh, just email me, and we can con uh, uh, discuss uh, using Zoom, for example. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Professor Kazuyuki Sakamoto. And uh, we're sorry we cannot uh, accept uh, further questions, so you can contact directly to Sakamoto Sensei in future. So thank you so much. But before we leave or uh, continue to the next session, we will have a photo session, Sensei. Can you hold for a while? So Not for sure. the committee, if you want to take a picture now, okay. Okay, maybe already. It's okay. Okay, thank you very much, Sakamoto Sensei. Much. Hopefully, and we I can meet again in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a good day. So, for the next session, we will continue with Professor Junichi Takahara from 9 uh, 9 30 a.m. of Jakarta time. So, we still have about two minutes uh, for break. Then, after that, we will continue with the lecture from Professor uh, Junichi Takahara. So, I hope uh, everybody can come back in around two minutes later. Thank you.